at Parliament House on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And this is a place where they have been meeting for thousands of years. I'd like to acknowledge those traditional owners of this area and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all of Australia's First Peoples. I also acknowledge our host, the President of the Senate, um, the Honourable Sue Lyons, and any senators or members who have joined us um, in the audience today. Also acknowledge those of us who, who are uh, joining us in the room and those participating in the lecture online. Today's lecture is being streamed and it will also be Auslan interpreted. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A session um, with our speaker and the president. It's now my pleasure to formally introduce the president and our distinguished lecturer, Virginia Hausiger AM. Senator Lyons has represented the state of Western Australia in the Senate since 2013. She was elected the president of the Senate at the opening of the 47th Parliament after serving as the deputy president in the previous two parliaments. The president is the first female Labor president of the Senate and only the second female president following the Liberal Senator Margaret Reid. In her time in the Senate, the President has represented Australia at the United Nations Women's Forum, delivered statements as a national delegation leader at the Women's Political Leaders Reykjavik Global Forum, and has produced reports calling for gender equality at both the Inter, um, Interparliamentary Union and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Against this background, it's fitting that the President has invited a leading Australian gender equity advocate and award-winning broadcast journalist, Ms Hausiger, to deliver this, the inaugural President's Lecture. Ms Hausiger's extensive media career spans three decades across the major Australian broadcasting networks. She's anchored primetime national news and current affairs programs, including 15 years presenting ABC TV News in Canberra. For many of us in our room, she's a very familiar face. As a long-standing advocate for women's rights, Ms Hausiger established a gender equality research initiative at the University of Canberra, where she is also an adjunct professor, and she founded the media platform Broad Agenda, where she served as chief editor until 2021. In addition to her roles as an author and social commentator, Ms Hausiger has served as a patron, ambassador and board member of local and national organisations, including the Canberra Rape Crisis Service, the UN Women Australia, Our Watch, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative and the Stella Prize. Would you join me now in welcoming Ms Hausiger to deliver the inaugural Senate President's Lecture? Thank you very much, Jackie. And thank you, Senator Lyons, for inviting me to give the inaugural President's Lecture. It is truly a great honour. And I want to also thank those of you who've come today. It's wonderful to see friends and colleagues in the audience. And I want to pay a particular respect and acknowledge the presence today of Elizabeth Reid, I am so delighted and honoured that you have joined us today. In pondering why Senator Sue Lyons is only the second woman to be appointed President of the Senate in 123 years, following Senator Margaret Reid as the first woman President in 1996, I've been musing over the vexed issue of women and politics and the 30 shades of grey that lurk like ghosts around this house, which led me to the wise words of one of the greats, Sir Robert Menzies. In 1939, the Daily News in Sydney ran a screamer of a headline, Women Terrify Prime Minister Menzies, he'd shouted in capital letters. Now, as far, as far as headlines go, that might be a reasonable statement. We all know women can be very terrifying. But unlike prime ministers who don't publicly admit a fundamental fear of women, Menzies did, openly. I have never been so terrified in my life as I am at this present moment, he confessed to an audience of several hundred women representing 25 women's organisations. Now, if that was a plea for leniency, the women didn't heed it. 
Instead, Prime Minister Menzies copped a hammering over his fiscal policy and was heckled by angry women over his apparent lack of understanding of equal pay of the sexes. Equal pay for the sexes. Menzies, to his credit, took the blows and reportedly heaved a sigh of relief when he left that hall. The women hadn't held back as Menzies was known to be a keen supporter of women's progress and political participation. Indeed, he appointed the first woman to cabinet in Atlantis, although without a portfolio, she viewed her role as a toothless position and later said, they only wanted me to pour the tea. Interestingly, over half a century later, Katie Gallagher also learnt what it's like to be demoted to tea lady. As the newly appointed ACT treasurer, she arrived late for a national meeting of treasurers, heavily pregnant and puffing, and when she knocked softly at the door and entered the room, one of the chaps looked up and said, oh, we're not ready for morning tea yet. She was the only woman present at a table of men. Of course he thought she was the tea lady. What a delicious irony, though, now that 16 years later, Katie Gallagher is the Minister for Finance. And you know what? She's not afraid to pour anyone a cup of tea at her table. But I digress. Back to Menzies. In 1954, Nancy Butfield, a South Australian candidate for the Senate, gave a campaign speech with a rather snappy slogan, a woman's home might be her centre, but it need not be her boundary. Later, over a cuppa in the Lord Mayor's parlour, Prime Minister Menzies said, You did very well, Nancy, but I suggest you don't play it as a woman. Don't use your slogan. That won't win you support. The message to Nancy and all the other ladies to follow was clear. Parliament is not a natural place for women, so play it like a man. I've titled this lecture 30 Shades of Grey and Grievance, Women, Politics and the Gender Card. And I deliver it in honour of those hundreds of women who've run for the Australian Senate or House of Representatives and not made it. And also in honour of those rare and resilient women who have, including the 101 women who currently hold seats in the 47th Parliament. Since 1901, Australia has had 31 Prime Ministers. 30 men, one woman. Indeed, it wasn't until the 17th Parliament that a couple of women finally made it through that front door, Enid Lyons and Dorothy Tangney. And they were late, by 42 years. They arrived a whole generation after women, white women, won the right to vote and stand for National Parliament. Indigenous women didn't win that right until 1962. But it's not as if the floodgates were opened to females. Progress has been way too slow. It wasn't until 1980, 1980 that women hit double numbers for the first time with 10 women elected to Parliament in that election. It then took until the 43rd Parliament, the 43rd Parliament, 109 years into Federation, before Australia was finally ready to elect a female Prime Minister. But it seems the boys still weren't ready for it because that's when they really began to grumble about this thing they called the gender card. If political leadership were a card game, men are clearly much better at playing it. Either that or the deck of cards are rigged in favour of men. In a game where you must not play it like a woman, where you need to play it like a man, perhaps men are just much better than women at playing their gender card. Recently, a little-known South Australian senator, Alex Antic, took a swipe at the women in the Liberal Party, his colleagues, for playing the gender card and indulging in a grievance narrative. After rumblings of complaint over his bullish action in knocking shadow cabinet member and former minister, Senator Anne Rustin, off the top spot on the South Australian Senate ticket and claiming it for himself. His accusation of that hoary old gender card 
and grievance narrative shut down any further discussion, publicly at least. When our first and only female Prime Minister left office, Julia Gillard concluded her final press conference with a brief but provocative invitation. She raised the spectre of the so-called gender wars, in which she had been accused of playing the so-called gender card. Because heavens knows, she said, no one noticed I was a woman until I raised it. <laughs> she went on to say that gender doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain nothing, it explains some things. And it's for the nation to think in a sophisticated way about those shades of grey. As a nation, we've not yet done that. We have not stopped to consider in a sophisticated way, or indeed in any grown-up way, about the shades of grey when it comes to gender and politics. We've simply avoided that conversation. But it's a conversation we have to have. Most importantly, we need to talk about men and how they play their gender card. We've talked about women, all right. Indeed, during the last few years of the Morrison government, it seemed to be all we were talking about. On the 15th of March 2021, over 100,000 women collectively bellowed on the streets and cities in towns right around the country to take the talk about women right back to Parliament. The PM at the time famously didn't join the conversation. Instead, he told women that they were lucky they were not shot, mowed down by bullets, presumably, at his own command. Scott Morris's government endured two years of headlines about its women problem, which, with the help of chaps like Senator Antic and as evidenced in the Liberal Party's official review of the 2022 election, the woman problem is a lurking problem still waiting for a fix. In 2019, it was an international story. Even the BBC was pondering the problem with headlines such as why politics is toxic for Australian women. What is it, journalists from the US, the UK and Europe asked about the larrikin and aggressor MPs that thrive in Australian, Australia's Parliament House? And it wasn't just the MPs that captured broad public attention. The shared video image of young male staffers in this house masturbating over a female MP's desk was a new low point. By 2021 and the release of Kate Jenkins' Set the Standard report, with its alarming revelations about the sexualisation and abuse of power in this house, News about women in Parliament had become downright revolting. The New York Times pulled no punches with headlines such as Like Fresh Meat, detailing rampant sex harassment in Australia's Parliament. You know, it's hard to talk about Australian politics without talking about sex as both adjective and verb. The sex of an MP is of primary relevance to the power and progress one makes in this place. And the sexualisation of women is of ongoing smutty interest. In 2018, Prime Minister Turnbull imposed the world's first bonking ban to stop ministers, men, having sex with their staff, women. I suspect then Minister Alan Tudge didn't get the memo which really should be of no consequence to any of us, except it is when Tudge's former mistress, who doubled as his media advisor, went public a few years later about the physical and emotional abuse she said she endured while having an affair with her boss. Her comments about the significant power imbalance and that she felt completely under his control made many women feel sick. Women in this house know only too well what gender-based power imbalance looks and feels like. After a very public and mind-bending period of gaslighting, Liberal Party defector Julia Banks wrote a whole book about it. But when it comes to the lowest blows belted at women parliamentarians, invariably, sex is weaponised. In 2018, whilst conducting a round of MP interviews for a research project on women in parliament, I found myself sitting in the office of Labor MP Emma Husa. 
I'd run out of tissues and her flood of tears meant this distraught and lonely woman needed a box of them. For a short moment in 2016, Husa had been Labor, the Labor Party's it girl. She had managed to unseat a popular Liberal MP, Fiona Scott, who Tony Abbott famously praised for her sex appeal. But parliamentary life had not gone well for Husa and by the time I met with her, she'd fallen victim to a disgusting sex scandal, a so-called Sharon Stone moment. It was alleged Husa had sat Nicholas in the office of her colleague, Jason Clare, and crossed and uncrossed her legs several times while Clare sat on the floor playing with his kids. Both Husa and Clare vigorously denied that that ever happened. But someone within the Labor Party orbit told media it did. A later inquiry, whilst upholding other complaints about Husa's managerial behaviour, rejected the lured conduct allegations. But it was too late. Husa was a goner. Slut shaming is one of the most devastating political strategies weaponised against women. A slut shamed woman in parliament rarely survives, unless, of course, you have the uh, metaphorical balls of Green Senator Sarah Hanson Young. Winning her seat at just 25 years old, this exuberant, attractive young woman copped years and years of sexual innuendo, smears and smut talk from parliamentary colleagues, radio hosts and media commentators, until she decided to call it out and to fight back. During a Senate debate on women's safety in 2018, in what is now an infamous moment in the history of women in Australia's parliament, Liberal Democrat David Lionhelm yelled across the chamber, you should stop shagging women, Sarah. She said the words flew across the chamber like bullets. When she later confronted him about it, he smirked. She said, you're a creep. He said, fuck off. Now, that might have been the end of it, but Lionhelm later expanded his slut shaming outside parliament, talking up the story on radio and TV even incorrectly naming who Hanson Young had slept with. Senator Hanson Young then did something women in politics studiously avoid. She went on the offensive and demanded a public apology. She later wrote in her short book, On Guard, Lionhelm supporters were in overdrive on online forums and social media, writing foul and vulgar comments. And please brace yourself for the language ahead. Sarah's always been a slut. Why would anyone fuck that fat assed slut anyway? Face it, you're a slut. No one is trying to shame you because sluts like you have no shame. One caller to her office said if she didn't stop demanding an apology from Lionhelm, he and his mates would find her and rape her. Another caller threatened to rape her nine-year-old daughter if Hanson didn't learn to shut up. Now, I share this foul, re foul, foul material for two reasons. Because Australians need to know what women in politics and women of profile endure. And secondly, because Hanson Young has chosen to tell her story publicly. So many others don't because they can't. Or they feel it's safer to hide their humiliation. Hanson Young wrote, the reality is that this is the sort of treatment you can expect if you're an outspoken, outspoken woman at the intersection of Australia, media and politics, and it's a bloody shame. Frankly, I don't think shame really describes it, do you? In her revealing book, Sex, Lies and Question Time, former Labor Minister Kate Ellis, another woman who endured unprecedented focus on her looks, her clothes, her sexiness, her partnership status, Ellis wrote about Senator Hanson Young's experience with shock and guilt, admitting she had failed to offer any support at the time. I had been so unaware of the extent of what she'd been going through, wrote Ellis. It shows how hardened those of us in Parliament have become. Kate Ellis and Tanya Plibersek have publicly expressed regret over not calling out the sexism experienced by women parliamentarians well before Julia Gillard was forced to finally fight back. Isn't it ironic that the most cited, quoted and talked about speech in Australian political history is a speech 
about misogyny and sexism. More academic articles, PhDs, essays, songs, musical, theatre, TikTok hours, media space and public discussion forums have been devoted to Julia Gillard's 2012 misogyny speech than any other parliamentary speech in Australian history. Not one of the 30 grey men who have sat in the Prime Minister's seat have ever made a speech that has been discuss discussed around the world like this one. And all because Gillard called out and rallied against a fundamental sexism and misogyny that just about every woman in Australia felt and understood, even if the parliament and press gallery didn't. Around the globe, panel discussions and podcasts are still discussing the misogyny speech, and not because anyone knows or cares about Tony Abbott or even Peter Slipper for that matter, but because the women over, the world over, are frustrated and tired of fending off sexist slights every day in every way, and the hypocrisy of patriarchy who purport to subscribe to inclusion and equity when in fact they don't. A patriarchy that resents women's presence in places of power and is fearful of women's political progress. According to the great British classicist, Professor Mary Beard, misogyny has been hardwired into culture from ancient times onwards, which is one of the reasons it has proved so hard to get rid of. This is also one of the reasons it's so hard to pin down, to identify and to call out. In her recent essay, The Future of Misogyny in the Monthly, philosopher Kate Mann describes misogyny as something women face rather than something men feel. Mann argues that misogyny is effectively the enforcing agent, the enforcing and policing of patriarchal norms and expectations. Misogyny is the behaviour that kicks in when the assumption of sexism proves incorrect, when a woman proves she is neither inferior nor willing to be subservient. In Julia Gillard's book, Not Now, Not Ever, marking the 10th anniversary of the misogyny speech, Professor Mary Beard repeatedly comments on how shocked she is, how much of the misogyny she missed for so long throughout her research career. Over years of close reading, she writes, I'm ashamed to say I had simply not noticed. You know, now that we all see it, though, we can't unsee it. It was telling back in 2012 to observe Julie Bishop's response to the misogyny speech. As deputy leader of the Liberal Party, Bishop was the most senior female opposition member and presumably others looked to her for a cue. She called Gillard's speech vile and defended the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, insisting he was not sexist. A good, reliable and loyal to IC, Bishop knew a woman in her position had little choice but perhaps to do as Menzies had suggested and play it like a man. Yet despite her own proven performance and outstanding success as foreign minister, Bishop's gender kept her permanently on the outside of her own party. Not only was she passed over for leader, despite being more qualified than anyone else in the room, on one occasion, she was the honorary woman in an all-male hit squad discussing a leadership coup when the blokes tossed around potential names for who they would anoint as their new deputy leader, apparently forgetting that Bishop was even in the room. Sometimes it doesn't matter how high the heels. A woman is so easily rendered invisible in Australian politics. <clears throat> Not even being the only woman in Tony Abbott's 2013 cabinet had counted for much. Eventually, Bishop saw the light, clicked those famous glittering red heels, quit and walked out the door in 2019. Of the 267 people elected to the Senate since 1901, 124 of them have been women. And of the 1,244 people elected to the House of Representatives, since 1901, only 155 of them have been women. Women currently hold 38.7% of seats in the House of Representatives. Theoretically, Australia's House of Representatives 
has never, ever been a representative house. The Senate, however, has succeeded in reaching gender parity with 56.7% of seats held by women. While Australia ranks 36th in the world for the representation of women in Parliament, interestingly and rather marvellously, as of April this year, the Australian Senate has the highest representation of women in a national upper chamber in the world. But please, do not share that latest milestone with Alan Jones. Jones was apoplectic about women rising through the ranks. In 2012, during a rant about Police Commissioner Christine Nixon, Jones bellowed across the 2GB airwaves, you've got now women at the highest levels of government, we've got a woman Governor General, a woman Governor of Queensland, a woman Lord Mayor in Sydney and a woman in Tasmania, it's just honestly destroying the joint. He later told his friend, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, to shove a sock down the throat of New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. So, does the presence of women in politics make a difference? Should it? Or are women still forced to play it like a man? As chronicled by Professor Marilyn Lake in her History of Australian Feminism, Getting Equal, Early feminist organisations believed in the, the distinctiveness of being women. Australian suffragists, such as Rose Scott, argued that women shared a particular experience that deserved separate political representation. She said, the whole point of the vote was to bring a new element into political life, not to accentuate the quarrels of men. In other words, not to play it like a man, but to play it distinctively like a woman, or perhaps in a more contemporary non-binary context, to play it distinctively as you are and never assume masculinity or male as the default, the norm. Without getting too theoretical or too technical, but to pick up on Gillard's invitation to do some sophisticated thinking about gender, what it means and how it matters, it's worth reminding ourselves that gender is in fact a social construct. We're born with a sex, but gender is learned. We learn how to be a girl or a boy. By the time we get near adulthood, the rules of our gender are very, very clear to us. As the celebrated gender theorist, Judith Butler, puts it, gender is a performance with clear punitive consequences Indeed, we regularly punish those who fail to do their gender right. And of Australia's 31 Prime Ministers, who have we punished the most? That wicked witch who failed to do her gender properly, our first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. She confounded all the norms, unmarried, childless, ambitious, politically sharp, devastatingly strategic, just ask Kevin 07. She didn't wear frocks or high heels and her kitchen fruit bowl was empty. Never has a woman so thoroughly, so brazenly and so publicly transgressed what a woman is supposed to be and do in Australian politics as Gillard did. The University of Adelaide's Professor Carol Johnson has thought long and hard about the gender card and how it's played in politics. She suggests women who protest about their gender being used against them by their political opponents are not only accused of playing the gender card, but their very challenging of their male opponent's sexism is itself constructed as a transgressive performance of femininity. In other words, the challenge itself is indicative of some kind of female immorality, a violation of femininity, a violation of the proper female behaviour. In Parliament, the word gender is invariably used to refer to women. As Johnson puts it, masculinity is the unacknowledged and assumed universal, the norm in public life. So men are often not even constructed as gendered. But, surprise, surprise, men have gender too. And they play it. Oh, how they play it. 
I want you to think about Tony Abbott, Mr. Action Man, Mr. Bare Chest Like Respedos Man, Mr. All Round Energy Man, Volunteer Lifeguard, Community Firefighter, Former Boxer, Super Cyclist. All of this cultivated in direct contrast to Kevin 07 Rudd. The nerdy, bookish, Chinese-speaking Mr Big Vocabulary Man, Mr Boring Man, who celebrated his election win with a cup of tea and a Vovo biscuit. Abbott would rather eat an onion, like a real man. <laughs> As Carol Johnson puts it, Abbott portrayed an image of an action man who got things done, while depicting Rudd as a wordy nerd who was all talk and no action. We see men use their gender card like a masculinity membership swipe pass, particularly around election time, when we see male politicians perform their masculinity in technicolour. You might recall the 2022 election was a daily bloke fest. High vis, hard hats, PMs and would-be PMs driving trucks, driving trams, steering forklifts, tossing the snags on a barbie, sitting at the local pub having a beer with the boys, belting a ball, kicking a footy, crash tackling a kid to the ground. <laughs> and there's also the husband and provider credentials, the lovely wife and family, preferably daughters, and a baby if you're lucky. Image after image, we watch the performance of manhood unmistakable maleness. Playing the gender card of masculinity in a society such as Australia, where our national identity is embedded in hyper-masculine stories of larrikins, brave diggers and Anzacs, male sporting heroes and ruddy PMs who love a beer and bugger the employer who won't give you a day off when the Aussies beat the Yanks with our winged keel. The gender card pack in Australian politics is well and truly stacked with maleness. When a woman does the unthinkable and boldly calls out sexism and misogyny, she's not playing a gender card. She's in fact playing the ace of spades, the ultimate symbol of strength and authority. It takes courage as a woman to stand up inside a system built and controlled by men. It takes courage to say no your assumptions of dominance, authority and divine righteousness are wrong. In the latter quarter of last century, Australia was a world leader when it came to women and political participation. We were the first in the world to pass a law against sex discrimination. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam was the first head of state in the world to appoint a women's advisor. Elizabeth Reid, and he needed her. Despite Whitlam's own strong conviction about the role and participation of women, there was not a single woman in the first Whitlam government and no woman in the House of Representatives. After the 1974 election, there were three Labor women in the Senate and two Liberal. But back then, well-organised and activated feminists worked from the outside in. With Reid at the helm, the scale and scope of reforms for women during the short Whitlam era were truly remarkable. But to my mind, of profound significance is what Reid achieved globally. Elizabeth Reid was the first person in the world to put sexism on the UN agenda. As the official Australian lead delegate to the 1975 UN World Conference on Women, Reid stood before the nations of the world at the UN podium and in a truly mesmerising speech laid out why sexism was the biggest barrier to women's progress right around the globe. Equality is a limited and possibly harmful goal, she said, explaining that structural reforms such as equal pay, equal access to education, equality before the law, the rights to vote and stand for public office, while all critical, were not the end goal. Reid went on to say, we can no longer delude ourselves with the hope that formal equality once achieved will eradicate sexist oppression. It will merely legitimise it. For there is a real danger, a very real danger, that satisfaction with the achievement of formal equality will encourage the belief 
that all problems are thereby solved. Their prophetic words, Elizabeth Reed was well ahead of her time. It is deeply troubling that now, nearly 50 years later, a belief that women have got everything they need, everything they deserve, that underpins our political discourse currently in Australia. That incorrect assumption and false beliefs about women's progress continue to feed male resentment as they ask, why won't those damn women just stop carping? The stench of sexism and lazy sexist swipes such as she's playing the gender card, indulging in a grievance narrative, still lurk around these corridors like ghosts of a past that never died. I began today with the words from Menzies, so let's end with another great man from the Grey 30, Joseph Lyons. In January 1934, the Sydney Morning Herald reported on an address made by Prime Minister Joseph Lyons about the success of the Liberal Party and the role of women. And I quote, I must give greater credit for what we have accomplished to the women. They are consistent, active fighters for their party and I have seen their organisations in all parts from Tasmania to Cairns. They are working steadily all the time, while men seem to be more spasmodic in their efforts, working especially around election time. I wish the men would follow the women's example. Perhaps Senator Alex Antic should sit down with Senator Anne Ruston at her table, offer to pour her a cup of tea and seek her advice on how to get ahead in politics. I'm guessing she might start by suggesting he pack away his cards. Thank you. But you sit in the middle. Do you want to sit in the middle? Thank you very much, Ms. Hausiger. I think um, giving that historical perspective to the topic really um, lends a lot of power to the, your arguments, and um, I found it an incredible talk, and obviously the audience did. We have uh, about 10 or 15 minutes for some questions, and we have helpers on the side who have mics. So if you have a question, if you could put your hand up, and someone will get a mic to you. I always say at this point, if you don't put your hands up, I will steal the first question. And I will. Goodness, they are a shy crowd. Um, perhaps what might be useful for both of you to reflect on, what does this mean for young women who are contemplating entry into politics? What, what advice do you think you would give to them about a career in politics and how to approach it? I think Senator Lyons is the best to, to kick that one off. Uh, I think I'm famous for um, encouraging women to always um, drop the just. Um, put your hand up if you're a woman who says, puts just in front of, saying, well, I could do it just. Yeah. Mm. So stop doing that because you only have to look at your male colleagues. They never say that. <laughs> they never say that. Um, they always say, oh, yes, I can do that, and I've done this, and I've done that. And we <laughs> always say just, or maybe, or whatever else. Um, I think for young women out there, if you want to be in politics, join a political party or stand as an independent and, and go for it. I think um, I've certainly found as, as a politician, particularly as a senator, the world is my oyster. Um, I came out of the trade union movement, so... I was used to the gender card um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it's, it's never bothered me. I, I met with a group of women some time ago and uh, some of my team are in the room and they'll be dying of embarrassment when I say this. There was a young woman in the room who said um, she suffered from imposter syndrome. Who said that? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. I had to Google it. And I said, why would you as a young woman describe yourself as an imposter. Like I just, so I said to the young women, and I've said to the young women in my office, me, me, we're not using that term in, in our office and you're not to use it about yourself. So if you use imposter syndrome, stop, because you're not an imposter, you're doing whatever it is and you're doing it well and don't say just and get
get on board. And I just want to say, Virginia, that was absolutely brilliant. Oh, thank you. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Lyons. Can I just pick up on the imposter syndrome thing? Uh, because I love this little story. Um, some years ago, I was interviewing um, Baroness Susan Greenfield, who is a neurophysicist. She's one of England's great, great thinkers. Um, she's written billions of books on the brain. And she mentioned the word, uh, the term imposter syndrome. And like you, I didn't know what it Thank meant. Goodness. <laughs> and I had to, to look it up too. But here she was, one of the greatest brains in the world. And she was telling me that she felt wow. imposter syndrome. So if you feel it, you're, you're not alone. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very common thing uh, among women. But Jackie, in answer to your question about young women and politics, um, I was sitting in the, at the press club in 2021 when um, the then Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, was giving her address. And she gave a, a stunning address. And uh, at the end of it, when she was asked questions, one of the, um, the uh, journalists asked her if she, would enter poli or if she would consider entering politics. And she said, she paused and she said, oh, no. And everyone laughed. And I thought, that's terrible. Here she is, an articulate, bright, uh, energetic woman who would be terrific in politics. And she was saying no. And everyone laughed because they agreed with her. What a horrible thing that would be for a young woman to do. So, you know, I, I, that was 2021. I jumped forward. Um, for me, the, the 2021 March for Justice, um, which of course was, was very noisy here in Canberra and right around Australia in 40 odd different locations, I think was a real turning point for a lot of women in realising that that stuff they feel about being on the outside, they're actually not alone, that we all feel this and we're angry about it. Um, so I actually now am beginning to feel a lot more optimistic about young women coming into politics. Um, and certainly, look, I've been a journalist since the mid 80s and yes, I was two years old at the time when I started. But, <laughs> but I, when I, 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 the first role I had as a, um, as a political reporter in the Victorian Press Gallery and um, John Kane was a Premier and Joan Kerner then took over, um, I was one of only, I think, three or four girls in the press mm -hmm. gallery of about 80 odd blokes, um, if, you if you include all the crews and what have you. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was all visually, as you and I were just talking about recently, visually that, that image of seeing so few women and, and so many men around can have an incredibly negative impact. But when I look around Parliament now, particularly the Senate, and see the diversity, and diversity of, of, gender, of, of um, ethnicity as well, and see the colour and see that distinctive difference, um, I, I'm feeling a lot more encouraged than I used to. Um, I'll just quickly tell a story, and I see that the Speaker's um, Chief of Staff is here, Charlie. I'm glad to see you, but uh, I'm going to tell the story. Um, <laughs> so the Speaker of the House, Milton Dick, is just the best human being you could have, and he truly is an amazing Speaker. And um, I've learned a lot from watching um, Milton because he has a way of speaking that, unfortunately, I don't. I'm very blunt. So Milton is really teaching... Uh, me how to be much more diplomatic and I thank him every day for that and he has the most amazing ideas but as you know he's very very tall um, and uh, so when I stand beside him and we're greeting uh, people welcoming dignitaries and other people to ha our parliament not so long ago last year um, he introduced himself as Milton Dick and the person who was coming into the parliament um, a former very high office holder in this country leant across and he said, and Mrs Dick, how are you? So I do like to dine out on that. Milton was beside himself with embarrassment. I think it's funny, but it also does tell the story. It illustrates really well in a humorous way the sorts of things that Virginia was talking about. In the hierarchy of the Commonwealth, I am the first person after the Prime Minister and yet uh, I can still be referred to as Mrs Dick. So um, <laughs> anyway, I do like to embarrass Milton with that. And um, he's, not, he's not here today, I don't know, but I'm sure he'll hear about it. But anyway, <laughs> but it's a funny story, but it also still demonstrates the reality that you can still be assumed to be mm. someone's wife. Mm, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that will have broken the ice for someone to ask a question. <laughs> Um, 
hoping this is on. Uh, so Anna Funder wrote an amazing book recently about the invisible role of George Orwell's wife, Eileen, in um, his political work. And uh, there's often been talk about the independence movement being a movement that was hiding in plain sight in Australia. How much do we think that that is because it's a movement that has an awful lot of women involved? I'll, I'll kick off on that one. Um, look, it, yes, it's a, and a really great question. Thank you. And um, yes, I'm a huge fan of Anna Funder's book, Wifedom. It's a phenomenal read. Um, mind you, it's interesting. She's won so many prizes around the world for that, pri that, that book. And yet um, the six men who've written biographies of George Orwell are very angry about it. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, I... Uh, I think when you say that the teals um, hiding in plain sight, it's, a, it's an interesting comment because women have always been politically engaged and women have run for politics right from the very first parliament. They just didn't get in. Uh, in fact, the very first parliament, Vida Goldstein and others, uh, she ran five times, I believe, and never got in. Women have been there. I think the change has been that, um, fortunately, with... and, and I, I really don't believe in the trickle-down theory that if you get a few women in, you know, more will follow. We have to work really hard at it, which is why I firmly believe in quotas. Um, I think it's insane that Australia ranks 36th in the world for um, political representation of women. We should be right up the top. There's no reason not to be. So I'm very, very much a believer in quotas. I think it's time. But um, I think there has been a change, though, again, as I said before, I think 2021 was a real shifting period for gender relations in Australia because we saw so many women speak up, use their voices. Um, going back to 2021, the Australian of the Year, that year every Australian of the Year in all four categories were all women, all very, very strong outspoken women. Um, I think upon seeing that, those women that have been there um, in plain sight, as you say, uh, have been empowered by it, have been encouraged and inspired by it. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens next election in regard to the uh, uh, um, voter attraction to the Teals. And I might just add to this, I don't know if, um, if uh, Andrew Lee is with us, Assistant Minister Andrew Lee, but I was reading a paper recently that Andrew Lee um, co-authored with Amy King from Oxford University. It was about 10 years old, but it was looking at voter um, voting bias against women at the ballot box. And they, typical Andrew Lee, who's quite a nerd about these things, they had uh, examined every single election post from uh, 2000, uh, 1903, the, the first um, election post federation, right up to 2004, and voter um, patterns around men and women. And they found that voters actually um, penalised women by 0.06%. So women were voted against even by other women. Now, as I said, that was 10 years ago that that study um, was, was published in 2014. I think it would be really interesting, and hasn't been done since, so I think it would be really interesting to see some research post over the last decade, looking at elections from 2004 right up to 22, to see if that still, that voter penalising um, of women exists, because I suspect it doesn't anymore. I, I suspect that's probably flipped around. Further question, just in the middle here. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Thank you very much. That was an amazing um, lecture, Virginia. Um, so we've talked quite a lot about what the problems are, um, and you've mentioned quotas as one idea for moving forward. What other ideas um, do you or um, Senator Lyons have in the context of where do we go from here and how do we improve the situation for women in general and specifically in politics? Uh, I'm an absolute believer in quotas um, and I'm from the Labor Party and the Labor Party would not have changed without quotas. Um, I'm a firm believer in them. We still need them. Um, and I just think that is the only way forward. I, I worry. I'm very proud that the Senate um, has so many women um, elected. But for a lot of those women, it's chance 
not choice. And for as long as, um, as long as the choice for some women is about chance and not men making way for women, um, it'll continue to be throw the dice up and see, see what happens. So uh, maybe because I come from a system which is about quotas, um, I perhaps I'm blind to other systems. But as I talk internationally, I know for across the Pacific, for example, when you look at the parliaments across our neighbours, um, we are very short of women and those women are really struggling. And so we either have to create places or we have to have affirmative action because it's that the, the politics in the Pacific won't change unless, mm. unless there's mm. a radical change in how women get elected. Um, so I don't know if you've got mm. any other ideas, but... Well, I, I thoroughly agree with you on that, absolutely. Um, look, the only thing I would add to that is, um, and this is the message I'm trying to get through in, in, a, in a lecture like this, is that women do need to speak up, continue to speak up and push forward. Call out what they see, um, and obviously sexism and misogyny, but call out uh, any unfairness that they see in the systems or experience themselves and support other women mm -hmm. to do that too. And look, I'll just, I'll just use another example, and I'm sorry if I uh, seem to be, I'm trying to be very apolitical in this, but I keep coming back to Liberal Party examples just because there seem to be a lot of them. But, but just recently, earlier this month, we had the, the, the media story of um, uh, former Treasurer Josh Frydenberg um, uh, letting it be known that he was interested in, in, in coming back to Parliament and possibly running again for the seat of Kuyong because the boundaries have changed and possibly it's going to be, um, it's currently held by Monique Ryan, the teal, but an independent, but possibly it might be more of a Liberal seat now that the boundaries have changed. Anyway, this idea was floated. There is already a very, very good endorsed Liberal candidate in that seat, and her name is Amelia Hamer. She is, apart from being Oxford educated, a finance um, a tech executive, a very impressive young woman. She's also Liberal blue blood. She was the, I think, the granddaughter of, of Premier Dick Hamer from Victoria. So she's very well credentialed for that position as candidate for the Liberal Party. And I thought it was really interesting when um, Josh Frydenberg's um, desire for this to take the seat, even though she's been endorsed by the party, she's been out there doing the work, um, there immediately was a pushback from young women, immediately. Um, and the young woman, I'm sorry, I can't recall her name, but she runs the Hilmer uh, Network for Young Liberal Women. I think it's Charlotte um, Mortlock, possibly. Um, she went on air and hit social media saying things like, I just want you to know, Josh, that you know, we liberal, young liberal women are not seat warmers for you lot. <laughs> um, she actually said that. So I thought, you know, isn't that interesting? These women are really pushing back. Now, within, I think it was 30 hours, he pulled out. And he didn't mention the gender card or an even a grievance narrative. He, he didn't dare. So I think, you know, women pushing back and supporting other women to do that does make a difference. And I'll pick up on something you said, Virginia, and um, just a while ago. Um, and that is you're optimistic about the future. I'm from Western Australia and um, I actively promote women. I have a significant number of women in my office. Um, and there is no shortage of, in my view, of women who actually mm. want to be candidates. I think mm. our problem is we don't have enough seats. Um, honestly, I, there are many mm. women out there. And, um, you know, there is the saying, it's a bit corny, but seriously, you can't be what you can't see. And so um, it is up to women in um, politics to seek out other women because you're out there. I mean, I've met many young women in Western Australia who see a political career um, for themselves. Mm. And um, I'm optimistic about them as well. So. Yeah, and no, I think it's exciting. And I'll just add to that, there's a really fantastic NGO that was set up by a few women in Sydney called Women for Election, um, yes. and they've been very involved with Parliament House too. And they run some fantastic forums for anyone who wants, to, who's interested, any woman who's interested in um, uh, politics, not necessarily even just to be a candidate, but might be interested in policy or, or working in politics. Um, and they run fabulous, fabulous um, uh, webinars and conferences and summits and what have you all around Australia and I've been I've spoken to a few of those and, and they get a, as you say a huge number of, of young women 
and in fact, uh, just women who are really interested in getting involved and, and participating in politics. So, yeah, it, it's, it's optimistic. And we've got an organisation in Western Australia called She Runs. It's completely mm. apolitical. And uh, is Nia here? Uh, so a young woman in my office came out of that program. I, just, she's, I think she's up the back there. Put your hand up, Nia. I'll embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> it's apolitical and um, uh, it, the organisation invites uh, men and women from all political parties uh, to come along and address uh, those women who participate. And they are the most amazing mm. women. And mm. a lot of them have gone on to, to take on leading roles in... Uh, local government or just watching their progress as young women of um, all different backgrounds, particularly called backgrounds. It's a, just an amazing local Western Australian organisation that's uh, punching way above its weight. So, mm. yeah, they're around and um, those women are, are terrific. Mm. I think we have time for a final question, if there is one. Just the gentleman down here in the leaf. <laughs> hello, uh, thank oh, you, oh, Virginia, sorry. and um, hello, Sue. I'm Kath Whitty, and we shared oh. some work at the United Workers Union where I um, was advocating for early childhood educators. I just want to say I've come from door knocking from my younger sister, who's running as a new um, Labor candidate in ACT, and my my I just have my the fire in my belly. It, it's taken me to be 60 though to do it, um, because I've always looked at. Um, politics and uh, women's rights through the eyes of very young children who I've worked with. I'm wondering, Sue, if you had any tips about how we should be raising very young girls and young women um, to effectively work in politics. Um, I'll, it's lovely to see you, Kath. And yes, we did work together at United Workers' Union. Um, I might go to Virginia and then have a think about that and and come back to it. <laughs> if you, no, no. I was going to say, I, phone, I don't really have an answer. To, not friend. being a mother or ra yeah. having never raised kids, I don't, you know, have something um, sense. Well, don't have something qualified to to say about that. Other than, you know, I just think it's so important with with kids, with children, to constantly be discussing with them what's going on in Australia and how it works. I'm always dismayed when I come across fabulous young people I meet at our universities who actually don't really know much about politics. They might be great at whatever they're doing or you know, great in their particular field, but they don't know much about how Australia works and what the democratic process is. And I, I find myself thinking, but you're doing medicine. How can you not know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's about talking and, and, and keeping the, the discourse at home um, you know, very open and, and dis not just talking about what's on the news but discussing the whys and the hows, that sort of thing. And I think, and all of us, as I think as women, the stereotypes are still out there. I mean, I, I'm sure as a parent I fell into the trap of stereotyping from time to time and I think, one, we have to be aware of it and, two, I guess um, I've spent my life challenging that. I mean, the trade union movement is often still depicted in the media as male-dominated, and it has not been male-dominated since Jenny George was uh, at the ACTU, which is a very, very long time ago, and yet the image of the trade union move movement in Australia is that it's blokey, when in fact it is not. Um, so I think we've just got to challenge those stereotypes, um, try and not fall into them ourselves. Um, but I think the point you made that um, about misogyny, that um, the, I forget who it was, the academic who spoke about it, I mean, I thought then, yeah, I've probably never really thought much yeah. about misogyny either. Um, and listening to your words today has made me think um, more about, like I'm a feminist, I don't make any secret about that. But um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about mm. misogyny, but there's many times it's out there, so mm. I, I guess I've just always been someone who's prepared to speak out, and you know, perhaps I can thank my upbringing for that. I don't know, but um, but yeah, it's there. Mm. Uh, that was Professor Be uh, Mary Beard, and yeah, I thought that was really fantastic actually that she admitted that that you know he, she, she is you know one of the world's greatest classicists, and looking back over history and saying I didn't notice, and yet you only need to look at some of you go back to Euripides. I mean, it is full of misogyny. Um, goodness me, and, and, but now she speaks for it. In fact, she was so shocked by her own 
negligence in, in, in seeing misogyny in ancient history that she then wrote a book about women and power and, and ripped into it. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how we sometimes don't see it. I think it's uh, one point I would make too in my various discussions over many years with parliamentarians, who, women who have indicated to me, oh, look, you know, you've just got to work hard, and who, particularly women who've been anti quotas, just work hard, and I, I worked hard and I, I fought my way through. And I understand that, and I, I really do. But um, not everyone gets those opportunities, you know, not everyone gets access to the sort of opportunities that you might have had through the union movement and that support. Um, and not everyone gets access that others might, access to mentors that others might get. Um, because I have had a number of women in this house say to me, oh, you know, I didn't have a problem, I made it, and Virginia, you made it. And it it's not actually about us. It's not about us. It's, a, you know, we're, we're lucky. Um, and luck is involved in, in career choices and what have you. But um, it is actually about broad broadening enormously the opportunity for everyone, women and men, girls and boys, to consider, I think, um, being, you know, significant significantly engaged in our political process. Well, time has defeated us, but um, I think I get the, the lovely job of thanking the President for inaugurating this series um, mm. and Virginia Housiger for an incredibly thoughtful lecture to kick it off, um, if you join me. Thank you. just thank also the Department of the Senate who when we raised this idea with them they embraced it wholeheartedly to Jackie for being our reluctant MC today but she's <laughs> done an amazing job so thank you very much Jackie and to Harriet in my office who's also worked on this and for Virginia because that was truly inspiring. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you and thank you for doing this and for inviting me.